Rosette and I'm back today with another decoding. This one is part 8 uh, in the Flat Earth Decoded series on the North Pole, Canary Islands, South America, and the Black Rock. So before I start I just want to say a shout out to my good friend Scotland Sean who's having a birthday here in a few days. So I'm wishing you all the best, Sean. Hope you have a great birthday, and I'm very thankful that you're in my life. You're a great guy. So, a quick recap of where we left off. In part one, we looked at the general symbolism of the flat earth hidden in our modern day vocabulary. In things such as sea level, call that because you see level. Here's a graphic I found where you can clearly see sea level is flat. Oh my gosh, global warming, fear, warning Jim, warning. See here, you're gonna, if you're in Venice, you're just, you're just toast. All right, and it goes up Los Angeles, yada, yada, yada. Venice is in trouble by the way not because of rising sea levels, but because the city is old and old buildings erode, especially old buildings in water. That's why it's having issues. It's in water. It's eroding from the water. And if you remember from my last presentation, there was a time when we had a great flood and the whole of the Mediterranean did have rising sea levels for a time. But with the global warming hype that turned into climate change because it was so obvious sea levels were not rising and God promising there would never be a great flood again, we can rest easy in at least that respect. Genesis 9:11, And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. Are we not surprised that they use this 9-11 against us? If God says no flood, that they will always do the inverse. That's their MO, right? They always do the opposite. Or why the Masons say, are you on the level? Because they know the truth, that the earth is level. Neil deGrasse Tyson is a Mason, and you know he says this. He uses his middle name because deGrasse is 33 in numerology. They are all about the numbers. So he speaks out of both sides of his mouth. He has a forked tongue, a snake tongue, just like his fellow ball earther Carl Sagan, who has Nagas, snake, cleverly disguised in his name, right? Sagan is the inverse of Nagas, Nagas. In Sanskrit, the term Naga literally means snake, but in Java, it normally refers to the serpent deity associated with water and fertility. In Borobudur, the Nagas are depicted in their human form but elsewhere they are depicted in animal shape. Sagan, Nagas. Oops, sorry, that's not them. Haha. <laughs> but might as well be. All four are actors, right? Here they are. What you thinking about? Nothing, just star stuff. Reminds me of NASA with its T. For the tongue of the snake. And it's no coincidence that NASA with a T, or Nasat, is an anagram for Satan. Nagas, Sagan, Satan. And we know NASA means to deceive in Hebrew. Right? Here it is. 
to deceive, greatly deceived, beguiled, seize, utterly forget. In part two, we went into the significance of the North Pole. How God designed his creation so perfectly that the center point of this plane lines up with the North Pole and directly above it is the North Star. Take the blue pill and stay asleep, believing the globe. Take the red pill and awaken, knowing that Earth is a geocentric, motionless plane. How the stars were made for signs and seasons, and how a clock is set up in a circular pattern as in the zodiac in the stars above, and how the zodiac is really the zoo d arc, Noah's Ark, symbolically portrayed in the heavens. Zodiac, Zoo D Ark. Well, we didn't talk about this next bit, but it totally fits. How the center, the North Pole, is magnetized, and how the oceans are made of salt water for conductivity. How the sun is positively charged, and the moon is negatively. By the way, Scott and Sean and I are planning on doing a chat very soon where we go over the workings of Flat Earth and some really cool stuff Sean dug up, so stay tuned for that. How the oceans are drawn into the center of the Earth at the North Pole and released out at the Antarctic Rim of Ice in a toroidal field. And how the torus looks similar to the hibiscus flower. See the little, the whites there look like water going into the, they would be the indrawing seas and you could see um, the hole there, it looks like a, it's swirling like a whirlpool and then the stamen right there would be the magnetic mountain in the middle, right? And then the petals would represent the islands that are all connected there at the North Pole. So the hibiscus flower, which Catherine of Russia points to on her dress around the time her men went to the North Pole. How even the Bible tells us the earth is firm and immovable. Psalm 93, 1. The Lord reigneth, he is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength, wherewith he has girded himself. The world also is established that it cannot be moved. And that God looks down on us from directly above at the North Star. Isaiah 40:22. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretches out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. And a verse here that I'm sure the Masons like. Revelation 29. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven, and devoured them. Compassed means to circle it, like with the Masons' tool, not to globe it. Compass and level it, or compass and square it, right? They're compass and square. In part three, we took a look at hidden symbolism in different forms of media, such as books and movies, in things like The Wizard of Oz, in which the land of Oz is clearly depicting the land at the North Pole. And how if we follow the yellow brick road, it takes us to the mountain in the middle. In part four, we looked at the Netflix series Into the Badlands with a place called Azra, which is really Asgard, and how it looks just like Emerald City of the Wizard of Oz. And even in Wolverine, Eden or the End, it says, just like in Stephen King's The Dark Tower with its North Pole map. Eden or the End, End World, Eden, Eden World, with the Dark Tower being the magnetic mountain in the center. From there in part five, we took a look at the lands around the North Pole to see if we have any connections. 
and we found a bunch. In places such as the Hebrides, which are islands off the Scottish coast. And Ireland, which is Aryan land. In part 6, we next looked at the Southlands and saw too in what way these lands are connected. Mary is connected throughout, like in the name Lemuria, La Maria, the Mary, and the Mori, or the Mary, of New Zealand. And finally, in part 7, we had a closer look at the story of Noah's flood and how there are some interesting connections with the Frisian book called the Aura Linda. Here mentioned in the book is the Garden of the Hesperides, which is the Garden of Atlantis. Notice how Hesperides is very similar to Hebrides, and Hebrides means the land of the Hebrews. Hesperides, Hebrides, Hebrews. So we continue our journey here in part 8 by expanding on where the Frisians went when they traveled west. In this episode we will end up in South America and in the next part we'll take a closer look at North America. I just didn't have enough time to fit it in so we'll do that in a separate part. Remember how in the last part we talked about Inca's people and how they decided to go west and find the tops of Atlantis. When they had counted the people and divided the ships accordingly, the fleet separated. We shall hear of Tunis afterwards, but nothing more of Inca. So no more mention of Inca in the Orlinda book. But let us imagine what happened to Inca. They went looking for Atlantis. Inca thought that perchance some high-lying part of Atlan might remain as an island, where he and his people might live in peace. And remember from part 6, we learned of the Nagati Hotu people who fled Persia and sailed to Central America. Apparently, Inca's people sailed that way too. And in the Oralinda book, Two, we learned of Frisians who sailed through the Suez Canal before the land lifted and formed a colony in India. So we can see how the same people migrated all over the Indian Sea, Mediterranean, and even the Atlantic Ocean in our past history. The name Himalayas is actually derived from a German word, Himmel, which means heaven. So Inca and his people sailed west through the Straits of Gibraltar looking for the remnants of Atlantis. They most likely came across what remained of this once noble continent. What were now tiny islands near the coast of West Africa are today known as the Canary Islands. Is there evidence of Inca's people there? It does appear there is. From the wiki we read, The Canary Islands has been known since antiquity, until the Spanish colonization between 1402 and 1496, the Canaries were populated by an indigenous population whose origin is still the subject of discussion among historians and linguists. The islands were visited by the Phoenicians, the Greeks, and the Carthaginians, According to the 1st century CE Roman author and philosopher Pliny the Elder, the archipelago was found to be uninhabited when visited by the Carthaginians under Hanno the Navigator in 5th century BCE, but ruins of great buildings were seen. Ruins of great buildings were seen. Just wanted to repeat that. Could these buildings be remnants of Atlantis? And remember, the Phoenicians, Greeks, and Carthaginians were all of the white race during that time. There are also unexplained ruins of pyramids on these islands as well. Cueva Pintada Cueva Pintada, or Painted Cave, 
in the little-known town of Galdar is one of the most important archaeological sites in the Canary Islands. Lost for many generations, this settlement belonged to the aboriginal inhabitants of the Canaries, known as the Guanches, thought to be of North African origin. Blonde, blue-eyed, tall, and light-skinned. They are something of a mystery to anthropologists, since blonde natives are a rarity. They were conquered by the Spaniards during the turn of the 15th century, but this museum and live excavation site gives a fascinating insight into pre-Hispanic life. As the name suggests, you can see prehistoric cave art with red, black, and white painted geometrical shapes at a site that may have been used as a dwelling, a sacred place, or for funeral rites. So isn't that interesting? There were blonde, blue-eyed, tall, and light-skinned people on the Canary Islands, the Guanches. And here is an antique print from 1947 titled Cave Sepulchre des Guanches. This original antique print shows the Cave of the Guanches, Gran Canaria, Canary Islands. Mummies prepared in the cave by the original inhabitants, the Guanches, of the Canary Islands while Western men are watching the process. So we saw evidence of pyramids and now we see evidence of mummification. And here's one of the mummies they found. Note that mummification is usually associated with ancient Egypt. Remember the pyramid ruins I just showed? Where did they come from? How about they never left? Most likely they were the survivors of ancient Atlantis who fled to the mountaintops when Atlantis sunk. The Guanches were the tall native inhabitants of the Canary Islands. They were just about exterminated by the Spaniards at the turn of the 15th century. According to the Encyclopedia Britannica, the Guanches are thought to have been of Cro-Magnon origin and had blue or gray eyes and blonde hair. These ancient mysterious people also left stone pyramids and mummified their dead. Where did the Guanches come from? In this painting of the captured Guanches leaders, we can clearly see they were white just like their Spanish oppressors. And remember the part in the Oralinda book we read here previously. Inca thought that perchance some high-lying part of Atlan might remain as an island where he and his people might live in peace. It reminds me too of the Frisians that colonized South America known as the Boers who also wanted to live in peace. Here is a painting of Boer women and children being held as prisoners during the Boer War from 1899 to 1902. This is the first instance of a concentration camp where women and children were starved and died from disease and infections. The death toll included 80% children. There are more than a dozen statues of the Guanches on the Canaries. You can tell by them that the Guanches were of the white Aryan race. Here's a close-up of one of the statues, clearly European features. Now I found something else very interesting. There is a flower called Dama de Bandama, Lady of Bandama. I couldn't find out what Bandama means which is endemic to the Canary Islands. Could this flower be a remnant of the plant life of Atlantis? Did Noah miss this flower when placing them into the ark? Were other species found around the Mediterranean once endemic to this lost continent? And does this flower remind you of any other flower? It totally reminds me of the German flower called the Edelweiss. Both have thin, pointy leaves with small white petals.
petals. Here is the Dama de Bandama. And here is the Edelweiss. Note too that the Edelweiss is found on the mountaintops in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. And if the Canary Islands are the mountaintops of Atlantis, then both flowers are found on mountaintops. Edelweiss means noble white. Germany's elite troops during World War I and II would wear the flower to show they are noble, courageous, and brave. They were good men fighting for their people, for their country, for all of Europe to remain free. Here are several pins they wore. Aren't they beautiful? This one says, Speersburg Führer, which means Hope Mountain Leader. So some remains of the people of Atlantis could be the Guanches, and some could even be from Inca's people. But with the restless, adventuresome spirit that the Frisian people had, Inca's people could have packed up again and headed west. There they came upon South America and met up with the natives that were later called the Inca. The words Inca, I-N-K-A, and Inca, I-N-C-A, are virtually identical. What are the chances these two words are related? I would say very likely. Now from the Incan perspective, seeing the white man on their enormous sailing ships, they thought they were gods. They called the leader Quetzalcoatl, which means feathered serpent. Now, if Inca and his people came with plumed hats, could this be where feathered comes from, if they have these plumed hats? Here is the German, Kaiser Wilhelm, from 1918 with a plumed hat. And look, he is wearing the Edelweiss as well. Queen Elizabeth, the last of the line of David, shown here wearing a plumed hat. We see Prince Charles and Prince William also wearing the plumed hat. The Vatican Swiss Guard with their plumed hats. And here's a painting of a soldier with a plumed hat. So we can see that this feathered serpent could very well be a white man with a plumed hat coming ashore. A very strange sight to a native Indian. And notice too, this Aztec priest with his mirrored plumed hat. See that? So he's copying the white man that came with their plumed hat and he's wearing one. From the wiki, the worship of Quetzalcoatl sometimes included animal sacrifices. And in other traditions, Quetzalcoatl was said to oppose human sacrifice. Notice the depiction of a white man being sacrificed by dark men. This seems to be what eventually happened to Inca, I-N-K-A, and his men. Did they flee just like the Nagati Hotu people? Quetzalcoatl was opposed to human sacrifice, but animal sacrifices could just be an extension of the offerings of the lamb like Abel offered God. So the natives first worshipped them like gods and then wanted to be like gods and so sacrificed them to take their essence. In Azatlan, we see in the ruins what once was a civilization that mirrored the island of Atlantis. With its land between water, land between water structure all the way to the main temple to the mountain in the middle, just like Atlantis was set up. The wiki further mentions that Mesoamerican priests and kings would sometimes take the name of a deity they were associated with. So Quetzalcoatl and Kukul Khan are also the names of historical persons. But more likely, Quetzalcoatl and Kukul Khan are the same person because the name means the same thing. And they did the inverse here, making a person into a god. 
similar to what the Egyptians did with the pharaohs, and some Europeans did with Odin, and later the Romans did with Julius Caesar, all men becoming gods. The Yucatec form of the name is formed from the word kuk, feathered, with the adjective suffix ul, giving kukul, feathered, combined with khan, snake, totsil khan, giving a literal meaning of feathered snake, kul kul khan, feathered snake. And kul kul khan could be khan as in king, cane, khan. We know Inca is an anagram for cane. Inca, Inca, cane, khan. Could the Canary Islands be named after Inca too? The Khan or Cain, Airy or Aryan Islands. Could Inca and his people have taken their name from Cain in idol worship? Followers of Cain? Canary, Khan, Aryan, Aryan King. So let's think this through. Cain's descendants were mixed because we know Cain had to take a wife from outside of the garden. And we know the Frisians were not of mixed race. They were pure Adamites. So if a Frisian took the name of Inca, we can only assume it is in idolatry or ignorance because they're not descendant from Cain, right? The Feathered Serpent. Matthew 10, 6. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So we are the sheep, wise like a snake and harmless like a feathered dove. Hence the feathered serpent, right? It's right in there, Matthew 10, 16. Serpents and doves, feathered serpent. Did the symbol at one time show the mortality of man? that we go through the cycles of life, experiencing birth and death and birth anew with each generation, as symbolized by the Ouroboros eating its tail. That's what I think the picture actually symbolizes. Because Quetzalcoatl's a good guy, so, you know, he's, he's not into human sacrifice. So that part wouldn't make sense, right? But it would make sense if it's symbolic showing the cycle of life. This feathered serpent reminded me of the Alfa Romeo logo. Alpha, A-L-F-A, same thing as Alpha, A-L-P-H-A, right? Romeo, or Rome, O, O for Omega. So we have the Alpha and the Omega with the red cross and the triple crown. And of course, the same feathered serpent eating a sacrifice. The official story for the origins of the emblem are a combination of the symbol for Milan, the Red Cross, the Visconti's family's victory over a Saracen knight, hence acquiring the knight's symbol, and the acquisition by engineer Nicola Romeo in 1915. And the Red Cross of Milan reminds me of the Union Jack union of the tribes of Jacob with the Alpha and Omega Tau, right? The Alpha and the Tau, the cross and the X in its flag as well. The wiki further states, one noted post-classic Toltec ruler was named Quetzalcoatl. He may be the same individual as the Kolkal Khan who invaded Yucatan at about the same time. The Mixtec also recorded a ruler named for the feathered serpent. In the 10th century, a ruler closely associated with Quetzalcoatl ruled the Toltecs. His name was Topiltzin K. Octal Quetzalcoatl. This ruler was said to be the son of either the great Chichimeca warrior Mixquatl and the Colhuancano woman, Chimilmon, or of their descent. So we can see here the miscegenation of Inca's people and the native inhabitants, the Mixtec, Mixquatl, and the Mexicans, Mixican, 
or mix cane. Mexican mix Inca, mix cane. It further states, the Toltecs had a dualistic belief system. Quetzalcoatl's opposite was Tezcatlipoca, who supposedly sent Quetzalcoatl into exile. Alternatively, he left willingly on a raft of snakes, promising to return. Note that this is the same dualistic belief system being taught by Gnostics, Satanists, Luciferians, and the Masons. It continues that the Aztec turned him into a symbol of dying and resurrection and a patron of priests. Remember the Aztecs originally came from Atland, also known as Atlantis, the fatherland, and so shared a belief system similar to the Atlanteans. And being a symbol of dying and resurrection would, of course, be in reference to Jesus Christ. Azatlan means place of whiteness, named after the Atlanteans. The various descriptions of Azatlan apparently contradict each other. While some legends describe Azatlan as a paradise, the Codex Albin says that the Aztecs were subject to a tyrannical elite called the Azteca Chichomostoca. Guided by their priests, the Aztec fled, and on the road, their god, Huitzilopochtli, forbade them to call themselves Azteca, telling them that they should be known as Mexica. Scholars of the 19th century, in particular, Alexander von Humboldt, and William H. Prescott translated the word Azteca as is shown in the Albin Codex to Aztec. Azatlan is mentioned in several ethno-historical sources dating from the colonial period and each of them give different lists of the different tribal groups who participated in the migration from Azatlan to central Mexico but the Mexica are mentioned in all of these accounts. Historians have speculated about the possible location of Azatlan and tend to place it either in northwestern Mexico or the southwest U.S., although there are doubts about whether the place is purely mythical or represents a historical reality. I would say that it was not located in the southwest U.S., since it was known to be an island, and there are many clues that it was actually situated in the Atlantic, Atlantis, Ocean, between the Americas and Europe in the north, and Africa in the south. Here's a depiction of the departure from Azatlan as an island, in the 16th century Codex Boturini. Azatlan is also depicted as an island in the Albin and Azcatitlan codices. So in several ancient texts, it's showing it as an island. But later, when the Aztecs adopted the culture of the Toltecs, they made twin gods of Tetzaclipoca and Quetzalcoatl, opposite and equal. Remember, twin gods opposite and equal would be considered dualism, not monotheism, right? Dualism. And dualism would be the same thing as pantheism, not monotheism. Quetzalcoatl was also called white Tezcatlipoca to contrast him to the black Tezcatlipoca. Together they created the world because white was the color symbol of Quetzalcoatl, it does not mean Quetzalcoatl was white. So I beg to differ with that author, right? Quetzalcoatl was white, and that's why it's his color symbol. And Tetzaclipoca didn't help create the world. It wasn't like two brothers creating the world, right? God created all things. God created everything, all things. The wiki continues. Along with other gods like Tetzalipoca and 
to lock, Quetzalcoatl would be called... I know I'm butchering these, I'm sorry. Ilpa Neho Huani. <laughs> Why do they have to be these long words, right? Which means, by whom we live. A title reserved for the gods directly involved in the creation. Because the name Ipal Nemohuani is singular, this had led to speculations that the Aztecs were becoming monotheist, and all the main gods were only one. I believe the truth is actually the opposite, though. The Aztecs were monotheists, but later became influenced by the Toltecs and their dualistic beliefs. The opposite, right? And notice here, so this is a picture from one of the codices that I'm reading from. And you can see here he has a plumed hat. The white man coming with the plumed hat. Quetzalcoatl. In some rural parts of Mexico, there still exists a belief that in some caves near certain towns, there lives a monster, a gray feathered snake that can only be seen by special people. Of course, it's only always only special people that can see this stuff, right? The monster must be placated for there to be plentiful rain. The feathered snake is also still worshipped by Huichol and Cora Indians. The cult of Quetzalcoatl has been more or less idealized and the image of a white god has become part of the popular culture. Some modern esoteric groups, sometimes called Mexicanistas, have mixed the cult of Quetzalcoatl with modern esoteric practices. There are also claims that Quetzalcoatl was either a lone Viking, Levite, Jesus, a survivor from Atlantis, or even an extraterrestrial. Personally, I think it's a combination of all of those with the extraterrestrial portion simply meaning outside of the land they were currently living. Because it's definitely not from outer space. Further on in the wiki, it tells us that the exact significance and attributes of Quetzalcoatl varied somewhat between civilizations and through history. Quetzalcoatl was often considered the god of the morning star. Jupiter, emphasis mine, I call it Jupiter, and his twin brother Exlatl was the evening star, Venus. As the morning star, he was known by the title, I'm not going to even try that word, meaning Lord of the Star of the Dawn. He was known as the inventor of books and the calendar and the giver of maize, corn to mankind and sometimes as a symbol of death and resurrection. Quetzalcoatl was also the patron of the priests and the title of the Aztec High Priest. Note that the Luciferians like to call Venus the Morning Star as well and use this as a symbol for Lucifer. But Jupiter is actually just as bright as Venus and can be seen in the morning as well. Jupiter would be a symbol for Zeus and symbolically the same as Christ. A symbol for Christ. Most Mesoamerican beliefs included cycles of worlds. Usually our current time was considered the fifth world. The previous four having been destroyed by flood, fire, and the like. Right? We talked about that in chapter 6, I believe. So here we have Mesoamericans believing in a great flood and their ancestors, the Aztecs, came from the sunken land. So more confirmation of Noah's flood being Atlantis, right? The land being Atlantis. On Quetzalcoatl, they further mention that his birth along with his twin Waxlotl was unusual. It was a virgin birth to the goddess Kawatiku. Alternatively, he was a son of this word and Mixquatl. So again, of a virgin birth. Only the seed of the woman came from a virgin birth. But he didn't have a twin, right? Like they're saying here. 
That would be part of the dualism, right? If he had a twin. Now I want to switch topics slightly here and expand on another thing mentioned in the Aura Linda book. From the book we read, from this black stone that they claimed had fallen from the sky was found the image of Sibel. The worship of such sacred meteorites is a custom that has its roots in deepest antiquity. This probably also includes the sacred black stone of Kaaba in Mecca, revered by all Muslims. It was allegedly brought to earth from heaven by an angel, and hence is likely one of these fallen meteorites from that worldwide conflagration. We find this comet that had seared the earth again mentioned in Daniel 2.35 as the stone that filled the whole earth, i.e. the comet that demolished the entire civilization of Atlantis. So here let's look at Daniel 2.35 and see what it says. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So they're worshiping the stone of destruction, right? The same black stone was depicted in the movie The Revenant. The rock splashes down in the water in front of him, sinking Atlantis, hitting King Arthur's whales, and catching the whole country on fire, devastating portions of South America. Could this be the same events or separate? It is hard to tell, but what happened to Atlantis seemed to be tied to the same stone that is being worshipped by the Black Cube Club. The same club that wants the real Israelites to be killed off. So let's look at this theory that a black rock, a comet, is what came down from the sky and devastated Atlantis. Is there any evidence of this? We mentioned hitting King Arthur's whales. Well, we know there was a famous comet that fell during King Arthur's time and was called the Dragon Comet. Two possible dates come up for this comet, 536 or 562 AD, with Alan Wilson and Bram Blackett thinking the latter date is correct. They believe this because Arthur's dates were shifted 33 years back. So the comments probably was two. Yes, 33, the pesky Masons were busy even back then. We'll just shift it over 33 years, isn't that funny? <laughs> They'll never know. There was much history written pre this comet and post, but during this time, very little was written. Hence the Dark Ages. Is this partly why the history of Arthur is so varied? The same comet was seen all the way over in Norway. Witnesses remark seeing a very bright light lit up the sky and disappearing over Great Britain. Hence the Norwegians calling it the Great Britain Comet. Others reported seeing it over Scotland and Carlisle which is a town near Hadrian's Wall. The comet was seen split in three pieces in its travel southwards. One piece went down Britain all the way to the south end of Wales, leaving utter destruction in its path. Now I can't help but notice Norway that saw this comet had a blue spiral appear in their sky in December of 2009. Do you guys remember that? Was this somehow connected to our 562 AD comet? Like they were commemorating the destructive event? You'll see why I mention this as we go along. A fire burned along its destructive path for 11 days, evidence of which can be found in several Scottish forts that were vitrified, turned into glass 
because the fire was so hot and intense. Over two million people died. King Arthur survived and brought the 5,000 people left alive in his land to Brittany to seek refuge. When there, he had a message sent to the Pope for assistance. The Pope replied back, Stones cannot fall from heaven because there are no stones in heaven. Therefore, what was said was heresy, and so no help would be forthcoming. This message was actually written in the papal record along with an order to destroy all reference to this comet. The order was only overturned when smaller comets hit Paris years later. Kind of hard for the Pope to deny them then, right? Oh, no help from the Pope. Yeah, he's really Christian, isn't he? No help from him. Don't help the poor victims of this fire, 5,000 people. Right? The rich church, don't help them. Brutusillo, aka the history of uh, Brennan E. Britannian, God, I can't say these words, Jesus MXLX1 stated, And then a star of enormous size appeared to Arthur, having a single shaft, and at the head of the shaft a ball of fire in the shape of a dragon. And from the dragon's jaws, two beams went upward, the one beam reaching towards the farthest parts of Frank, and the other beam towards Iwerden, which split into seven smaller beams. And Arthur and all who saw this spectacle feared, and they asked the wise men what it might mean. And then Meriden wept and said, I think that's Merlin, O nation of the Britannia! Now are ye bereft of Emery's Weldick, a loss that cannot be replaced. The foregoing quote was taken from the Brute to Silo, the most ancient surviving written history of the British Isles, which is recognized by the Oxford University as being one of the most important surviving artifacts of antiquity, thereby giving academic weight to the claim that an enormous comet lit up the sky from Ireland to Gaul, taking the shape of a fire-breathing dragon, which struck Britain with tremendous force and heat in November 562 AD, devastating both the population and the landscape. Notice here, a comet with two tails. Could this be one of the reasons they make the V hand sign? Because the comet came and destroyed, and they're all about the destroyer. Frankish historian Gregory of Tours, circa 563 AD, so just a little after the event. Chapter 24, Book 8, History of the Franks, described the cosmic event thus. This same year, two islands were consumed by fire, which fell from the sky. They burned for seven whole days, so that they were completely destroyed, together with the inhabitants and their flocks. Those who sought refuge in the sea and hurled themselves headlong into the deep died an even worse death in the water into which they had thrown themselves, while those on the land who did not die immediately were consumed by fire. All were reduced to ash, and the sea covered everything. Many maintain that the portents which I have said earlier that I saw in the month of October, when the sky seemed to be on fire, were really the reflection of this conflagration. And here's a picture of a vitrified rock in Scotland. You can see it, the rock is melted. So Arthur, getting no help from the Pope or Brittany, heads up to Norway and then over to Iceland. Did he stop at the North Pole along the way? We do have record of Arthur traveling there as well, written about in the Gestai Arthuria. It states that in 1364 AD, eight people came to the king's court in Norway, saying they came from the lands of the North Pole. One, a priest, mentioned that King Arthur sailed there May 3rd of 531 AD 
with 12 ships. Five of the 12 were smashed against rocks and were shipwrecked, but the other seven made it there. So the dates are a little off, but very close to the 536 and 562 dates. And these dates would be off by a couple thousand years if Noah's flood timeline is accurate. But the point being that one or more of these black rocks could have fallen from the sky to cause the devastation of not only Atlantis, but Wales and portions of South America. So the devastated area in Wales remained so for 11 to 15 years and was known as the Badlands. Does that remind you of anything? How about the show I mentioned earlier called Into the Badlands? Or the area of desert the gunslinger had to cross over to get to the Dark Tower that was also called the Badlands. And remember that the gunslinger was based on King Arthur. See, truth hidden in plain sight, right? We also can look to the Mad Max movies for similarities of the scorched earth and how it would be to live there at that time. So if we look at the trajectory, it came in over Norway and crossed Britain from the northeast to the southwest. The second part that broke off went over Ireland which did catch on fire and is recorded in their records. And the third kept on going until it flew over Brazil, ending in Bolivia, very possibly into Lake Titicaca. Evidence of this are the ruins of Puma Punca, an ancient megalithic structure that got knocked apart. Blocks weighing several tons were thrown about like kids' wooden blocks. See, here's pictures of it. And here's an aerial view. Bolivian, Brazilian, and Mexican records speak of this time where crops failed and trees would not grow. Mountain peaks in Mexico also have shown evidence of glassification, similar to what happened in Scotland. Now, after Arthur's Comet event, the Mexicans put on their pyramids a spiral symbol. Was this to commemorate the comet as well? It can be seen on Hopi murals in the southwest U.S. as well. See it here? Remember the Norway spiral mentioned earlier? Is this the same spiral on the Hopi mural? Looks very similar. Also in Wales, the comet was called the Dragon Comet with dragon being the combination of two words meaning lightning stone in Welsh. And the first time a dragon appeared on a flag, the red dragon of Wales. Another amazing note in Geoffrey Monmouth's The History of the Kings of Britain states that Arthur's birth was portentous for it was foreshadowed by the appearance of a strange dragon-shaped star during the reign of his father Uther Pendragon. Uther Pendragon means top dragon, right? That means the top king. Isn't that interesting? So there was a dragon comet when Arthur was born circa 500 AD and there was another one when Arthur was a grown man with the same appearance. The first didn't hit ground zero though, right? But the second one did because there's no mention in 500 AD of um, this conflagration and destruction. So is that why they worship the black cube? Because it destroyed white civilizations? We see this symbol everywhere. From Black Rock City at Burning Man, right? A pagan celebration to the Wall Street's black cube, right? We see it in many places, Manhattan, Denmark, Australia, Santa Ana, but there's many others too, just not showing here. To Harvey Weinstein's black cube company, black cube, a select group of veterans from the Israeli elite intelligence units that specializes in tailored solutions to complex business and litigation challenges. Look, he's doing the hidden hand in the picture, right? So that's who um, Harvey Weinstein used 
to find out about people, you know, finding things out about him, see what they know. And this guy right here is the one that did it. This, he's one of his spies. To the upcoming blackout of 2022. Truth in plain sight, they had this in Blade Runner. Blackout for three days, and then after that, the world changed. 2022. Foretold at Diana's funeral with the three black swans. They released three, right, at the funeral in the lake. A swan is symbolic of the number two. If you look at it, it makes the shape of the number two. So three of them would be 222 two, two, or the year 2022. Blackout 2022. King Arthur left Wales because of this same devastation by the Black Rock. It impelled him to travel to the North Pole and then later to North America. We'll take a closer look at North America's connection to the North Pole and the history of the Israelites in the next part. And some interesting info on King Arthur I'll put in there too in North America. Were these catastrophes purposely done by God to get our people to travel to the four corners, to nudge them in their adventurous spirit to see the world and to conquer it? And what do we have now? Will this wonderful legacy of spreading civilization to the earth be for naught? For now, it looks as if Yahweh's people will be the ones to be conquered. People must understand it is a battle between God's people and the people God damned. God's people and the damned, right? That's who it's versus. It will be one or the other coming out on top. There isn't room for both. And depending on who wins, we'll determine what kind of world we have and if the world will even survive. Whenever Yahweh's people fled, that thriving civilization died. Always. It will be the same for the whole world. That is the truth. So people need to put their ego aside and help the white man. Unless they want their children to grow up in a world where they are slaves. The death and destruction awaits them. A crumbling world awaits them. Watch movies like Mad Max or The Road and you will see how the world will be. Roaming gangs of thugs, cannibals, cannibals. Only the evil will thrive. Will you carry the fire, Papa? On the other hand, if Yahweh's people survive, they will make the world thrive. New technology will be used to make free energy for cars and for homes. Everyone will have a home. Any form of money will be backed by the people's hard work and not by gold or fiat currency controlled by a few. People will do the work that they love. Work will not be toiling work anymore, but what one desires to do to better their community. God gave each of us special unique gifts for a reason. There will be no leader but Christ. We can finally thrive and live in peace. No man is a slave. All men are free. And the world will be a beautiful place. That's how it can be. Take care. Stay tuned for part nine. Yahweh bless. Oh, what day it is today? Um, the first day of the rest of our lives? No. Sean Connery's birthday? Sean Connery's birthday. Sean Connery's birthday. Sean Connery's birthday.